Um, thank you very much. Thank you for being awake so early on the third day. Um, so my name is Nicolas, and this is called Django for Life Science. Very briefly, uh, who I am. Uh, I am a software developer from Belgium. I'm working on my own, you can call it a freelance consultant, whatever. And I like to think of my way of working of being more like an artisan than a chain worker, if that makes any sense. And my, my niche uh, for the last 10 or 15 years has been uh, software for biodiversity research, and that's what I want to talk about today. So um, what we will do, uh, I will present a few concrete examples of what I do, because I guess that um, software for biodiversity research is a bit abstract. Uh, I'll tell you why I think Django is very good at it. Uh, some tips and lessons learned along the way. Uh, I try to keep those tips uh, useful for a broader audience, even if I do something a bit, uh, a bit on the side. And uh, finally, some possible improvements uh, that can still happen in the framework and the community. Um, what do I do? Software for biodiversity research. Um, basically, biodiversity is the, the variety, the diversity of uh, all forms of life on, on the planet. Uh, and I don't want to bring bad news in the morning, but as you probably know, uh, there's a big biodiversity crisis right now, which is kind of similar to the climate change uh, issues. Uh, it's also, also human-caused, uh, and basically the species go extinct at an alarming rate. Um, According to the latest estimates, in the next hour, we will lose between one and three species, probably. And most of them are probably not known and not described uh, from humanity, and it will just be lost forever. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, so if you want to protect nature biodiversity, you need to understand it. To understand it, uh, you need some people to study it scientifically. And to study it, you need good, good data. And that's really where uh, we can help as software developers. Um, we can help sharing data, exchanging data, transforming data, visualizing data. Um, that's really where we can, uh, as a community, help scientists do their job and do their job better. And uh, yeah, that's what I do. I will show two concrete examples now and then uh, more during the, the talk. Um, first one, uh, it's a tool we developed to visualize the bird movement, the bird migrations, uh, using the data coming from weather radars. Because basically, if you want to uh, study bird migrations, uh, you have a few options. Uh, the first one is just to use your eyes and look at the sky and look for birds. Um, it doesn't scale really well at the, at the scale of a continent, for example. It doesn't work when it's at night, and many birds migrate at night. Uh, it doesn't work when it's cloudy. So yeah, it's not great. And that's probably why, until a century ago, uh, people in the northern hemisphere had basically no idea of where all the birds go during winter. And there were crazy theories like about that, like they transform to other animals, those kind of things. And finally, a century ago, uh, people spotted a stork, this stork over Germany. It was still alive but he has an arrow um, in the neck, and the arrow really look like the arrow they can see in, uh, in Central Africa, and that finally gave the idea. But for most of the humanity, we had no idea of what the birds did. Um, another option than using the eyes is using uh, specific bird radars for, to do that, but the specific equipment is very expensive and it's very difficult to convince authorities to install bird radars uh, everywhere if you were a bird scientist. So um, some smart people say, okay, but what we can do is that we already have, in most inhabited uh, places on Earth, a very good um, array of, uh, of weather radars, because we need weather radars to follow precipitations, thunderstorms, and all things that are really needed for human activity. So the radars are already there. And if we smartly filter out the data, we can probably distinguish uh, the Nico on the radar that is coming from a bird, the Nico coming from an airplane, or uh, other phenomenon. Uh, or clothes, basically. So other people, much smarter than me, developed uh, algorithms for that. And where we could help was basically to do all the plumbing and to 
put all the data from a, a wide array of networks together and make them communicate in a common format and uh, put all that in a central repository and build a web application to show nice graphs about that. And, and you have tools like this one where you can, there's a small uh, map of Europe on the left. You can select a radar anywhere. You can select the time and have an idea of the, the number of birds that are flowing around uh, at the time. Uh, just a quick question for the audience. Uh, if you see on this graph on the left, there's a big peak. Uh, you can see January 1st uh, around midnight. Any idea of what it is? Yeah, exactly. Fireworks, people partying, and the fireworks met, make the birds really scary, and they all fly. And you can basically see that on every radar uh, every, every year. Um, another project, this is about tracking invasive alien species because invasive alien species do great harm to ecosystems and like every kind of invasion, uh, the earlier you, you can uh, work on it, the, the better it is. It's much more difficult to eradicate a species if it's everywhere than if it just arrived in a specific location. So you have people whose work is to, is to basically do that and manage species on the field. And this tool allows them basically to be alerted as soon as possible. So data is downloaded every night uh, in the web app uh, from a data aggregator called JBIF, where all the biodiversity, open biodiversity data is basically. And um, the users can basically create alerts and say, I am interested in this and this species in this specific location. And I want daily email for that. And they receive the emails. And uh, so they can go to the web app, get the exact location, and, uh, and go work on that. So those are two different examples of things we can, we can do for biodiversity research. And I will show you more uh, with different uh, examples. I have worked in um, different companies, different organizations, and now on my own. But there are a few things about those projects that is quite different than, than um, probably most, uh, most, of, most uh, common development works. Uh, and that has an impact about how, how we work. So I will briefly cite them. Um, basically, it's often small projects, which in a way is easy, but you're almost alone for that. I mean, you work in a team, but the other people are scientists, and you are the computer person, and everything related to software development, to data, to databases, to, to front-end development, to back-end development, it's just you, or maybe a few people, but uh, basically you work on small things, but all alone. Um, you have to work in close cooperation with, uh, with scientists, and it's, um, it's, it's interesting because uh, you're working with smart people that don't really have a um, programmer mindset, but at the same time, everybody code in a way because those people need to code for their PhD to do data visualization analysis or everybody that. So there's code, everybody codes, but um, they're not really developers. And that, that's interesting to try to, to fit a niche and to be, to be helpful uh, alongside those people. Um, something different is generally about the code at least the environment is not uh, competitive. People are not fighting against competitors to sell a product or something. So they are really uh, open to work in the open, work in a collaborative way, have everything public in the default, put things on GitHub. That, that's basically part of the culture, also because science should be, in theory, at least repeatable. So if you do an experiment and you need software to do this experiment, other sh people should be able to do that. And to do that, they need access to the code, of course. So uh, th that's a mindset that's more and more ingrained. And um, we have the luxury to be quite open. And that's something we can use at our advantage. I will talk about it later. Um, the funding of those projects is a bit more problematic because uh, basically funding of science is still um, very much targeted at publication. People work on a project. They receive money. They work for two years on it. And then they write, uh, they write a paper, and there's no more money. And oh, it's fine. The paper is there. There is a result, and no more money. Of course, if you are building websites and web applications and data pipelines, and it's useful and it's used, and things should stay online, but hey, the funding is finished because it's been three years and there's a paper was published. That doesn't work well. Um, I don't have a magic solution for that, but 
we, we have something to, um, that's something we still have to do, and I have a concrete example for that. It's, a, it's an online database of Afrotropical mouse species. It's basically a, a website showing a very specific database. It's been developed like 15 years ago. Uh, there's no more money flowing in. And then you still receive emails very often from small group of researchers all around the world saying that the work is super important and they cannot do without your tool and that is super important to keep that alive and that is incredible and blah, 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 blah. And uh, yeah, but there's no money and it's using a very old version of Ruby on Rails and so how can we, how can we keep that uh, online? And that's a moral dilemma I've seen a lot. And a lot of things are working just because people want it to stay alive and it's not um, very professional, but that's sometimes the best thing we can do um, if, we, if we really want to help in the, in the context the science is, is funded right now. Um, why do I think Django is awesome for those projects? Uh, I like to think of myself more of a generalist and someone who like use the best tool for the job, but the fact is that I always come back to Django and to Python because basically I think it's often the best tool for the job. Um, I'll list a few reasons uh, now. The first one is probably obvious to many of you, the quality of the documentation and the community. Um, it's very complete, there's a great attention to detail. Uh, I still think the official tutorial is in many cases the best entry point to the framework. I remember when I started using Django, just doing the tutorial, and at the end of this, it was, wow, I already feel confident enough to start a real project with that. And I think that's something we take for granted, but um, it's not like that for, for every tool and every community and every framework, uh, unfortunately. Um, that's really something important. And in my own work, I, when I'm writing documentation, I always try to think to be as good as the, the Django documentation. It's a bit, bit like the unattainable target in terms of documentation for me. Um, that really helps. Uh, the other one is quite obvious too. I think it's the ability to very quickly prototype, and especially since uh, when you're working in my position, you also have to collect requirements from users and from customers. And in my experience, having a quick prototype and having people playing on it uh, allows really to get great feedback about what, what should work and what should be changed and those kind of things. Uh, you can do long meetings, you can do visual mockups of the screen, but if you can quickly build a prototype and send it to people, you get much greater feedback. And uh, I think that's very important and something uh, Django allows me to do. Uh, and this is especially true if you use the, the, whole, the whole framework, use the template, the form, the admin application, uh, you have everything there. If you are starting to use Django only as a backend, for example, it's more difficult to do a quick and dirty prototype. So that's something I do all the time. Uh, and after the, the challenge is to reuse or rewrite this prototype as a proper solid product, but um, that's a very useful tool too. Um, and at the same time, I say, I want a framework that allows me to develop very quickly, uh, but at the same time, I don't want a framework that change every night. And uh, that's also something I, I saw in other communities and with other tools. And, you have a version one of the framework, and you use it, you learn it, it works well, and then one day they announce version two, and oh, it changed everything. You have to just rewrite everything. Um, that might work for companies that have a product that is continuously maintained, but for me, with tons of small web apps, sometimes very old, that should stay alive for a long time, that would just make my life crazy. And so the, the approach that Django has, I mean, having a very good, solid basis and very good core, and then it still evolves, but it's optional, uh, optional stuff, it's new features, it doesn't reinvent the wheel every, every week, and when it changes things, you have great documentation about it, about how to, to manage the migration, you have long-term release. Uh, I mean, the way Django is released and the, a certain kind of slowness uh, and, um, is really, really uh, important, and that's really something that uh, sold me. I used to use uh, Ruby on Rails um, 10 years ago, and uh, yeah, I had a very different experience, and can really see that th those things, the, 
the speed of release and the quality of the documentation are really the things that made me use Django uh, all the time, and I, I don't really regret that. Um, another reason is the admin side. I know that the documentation said don't use the admin side for your users, don't send people uh, to the admin side. Of course, that, that's true. The admin site is not the one to build, uh, I don't know, an e-commerce website and so anonymous visitors to buy things on the admin. That would be, that would be crazy for a variety of reasons. Uh, but for what I do, the admin is often good, good enough. And, uh, and it, really, it really helps to develop things quickly. And I have another example here. Uh, I built this um, catalog of the butterfly of Belgium, basically, a few, few years ago. You have all species of uh, butterflies that appear in Belgium there. You can, yeah, it's an online database, nothing, nothing too fancy. You can explore from a variety of, um, of sources. You have pictures, you have details about species, their distribution, uh, pictures about that. Well, you, you see the thing. But before we build that, how these uh, people, um, were managing their data. Well, it's quite simple. There were maybe five data editors. Everybody has an access database on his laptop. Everybody was updating the data daily. And on Sunday, they just meet over coffee, and people start copy-pasting data from one database to the other. And then after, after a few years, um, someone say, OK, I stop working for six months. I take my version of the database. I copy-paste everything in Word, and I publish a book. And those people have crazy useful data for their niche, but that's all they had as tools. And that's what, what they did, and that was their way of working. Uh, of course, when you can quickly build them a website like that, and you do a small Django admin, and with that, they can, uh, they can all update the same database in real time, have everything published, have some data validation and automatically publish the data to, to common um, data exchange places like the Global Biodiversity Information Facility or download plant information from Wikidata to make the web page more rich or things like that. Uh, that's super helpful for them, and these, those people are, were blown away by what's, what's possible, actually. And, and for me, it was only like an admin pi file of 400 lines of code, so it's really, really worth it. And, uh, the admin was super useful for that, and yeah, that's basically a few screenshots from the admin, but you will learn nothing there. Uh, another reason why Django is great is Python explicitness. As I said, I um, always come back to old projects after a long time. Uh, I cannot deal with magic uh, with that. I'm not, my brain is not big enough to remember everything and how it works, so I really prefer um, 10 lines of explicit, simple, boring code than to something too smart that, that I cannot uh, maintain, basically, and that's really something I pay attention to. And this philosophy is quite, quite present in the Python uh, world, I think. That's, um, that's very good. The rest of the Zen of Python and the, that way of, of thinking is also useful, but I wanted to especially emphasize the explicitness. Um, another reason is the integration with PostGIS for geographic work and uh, with GeoDjango, because most of the data I deal with is as a geographic uh, component. And I would argue that most important data for the challenges of the century have a geographic component. I mean, if you're thinking about climate change, biodiversity, migration, inequalities, you cannot do much with the data if you don't know where exactly it happens. So to me, having the ability to store location in a database and deal with that is a super useful and use that all the time. And we have GeoJungle, which is great for that. And this is a small example of that. With just a few lines of uh, SQL code and Python glue, I'm able to do things like that, like having a few thousand points aggregating them uh, into hexagons at some zoom level, assigning a color, and sending back the, the data directly to the browser in a binary format. And Well, I have everything at hand to do that uh, quite quickly, and that's, uh, that's super useful. Um, another similar reason is the data science ecosystems. You, if you need to transform data, visualize data, analyze data, you have basically all you need in a in Python libraries, so that's, um, that's great. Um, some tips and some lessons learned uh, along the way. Um, 
I have one, I think the most important thing if you are working on your own, uh, you will always have to take decisions about if you should um, take a new approach, a new tool, a new technique. Um, and it's very tempting, and many things are released every day, and, uh, and basically there's a very fine line that you, you, have to, you have to find your place on this line, because if you just become too conservative because you don't have time, you just become the, the old man yelling at clouds. And in, in de software development, if you do that for 10 or 20 years, you don't use version control, uh, you don't write tests, and, and I think it's not, not acceptable uh, in the 21st century. But uh, on the other side, if you, if you are too excited by everything that happens, you, you end up uh, storing your very basic data in a blockchain and change a JavaScript framework every two weeks, and basically you just cannot deliver. Or you can deliver something, but you cannot maintain it. And if you're working mostly alone, um, it's your problem later, not the problem of the next guy. You are the next guy, basically. Um, so that's kind of like my obsession to not become too old and not get too excited about the new stuff. And uh, I think it's an important um, thing. And I don't really know how to do that, except try a lot of things, experiment, learn a few experiences, and at the same time try to always ask you what is useful for me, not what do I want to do, what is exciting, what is nice, but what is really useful and what is the cost of using something new. Um, something um, very similar about the dependencies for the project. I like to think of the dependencies of like a backpack. At the beginning of the journey, it's very tempting to put a lot of things in your backpack because oh, it's nice, I might need it, and, and blah, blah, blah. But later on, you have to carry that. And if the journey is long, it can become very, very difficult. So I think it's, um, it's important to be quite conservative about that, only use dependencies that are popular if possible, because there's a higher chance they will be maintained. Uh, don't use them for, for fut futile stuff and things that are not really necessary, like, um, like cosmetic stuff. And sometimes it's fine to just copy-paste a function from Stack Overflow instead of adding a huge package to use one function in it. Well, if you just need that function and you think it will be like that, probably more maintainable to just copy a single function to, than, to, than to install a package and its dependencies and, uh, and all that. So I think it's important to always consider the long-term cost and not uh, just add stuff that is, that is cool or looks cool. Uh, an example of that is um, should we use single-page applications with like a Django backend and a front end written in React or something like that. Well, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's very useful. Of course, Facebook didn't even did React for, for fun. It solved the problem for them. But uh, most of us are not working on the same kind of scale and the same kind of problems than, than them. And uh, I've seen that too often, I think. People just use React because everybody uses React. and. Um, Sometimes it doesn't make sense, and it's difficult. You have to maintain Webpack. You, uh, Webpack. you have to maintain different web applications, make things work together. It's, in my way, it should be carefully considered. And we have other alternatives now, like HTMX. Uh, never had the chance to use it, but I'm sure I will love it, so I would like. Or even if you are using Vue.js, you can include it in a very lightweight way, just a simple tag, and use it for a, small part of your web page and continue using uh, Django templates and forms for, for all the rest. And I think for smaller projects, uh, that's an approach that, that sometimes works quite well. Um, another example, NoSQL, it could be tempting to use NoSQL databases. But if you are already using Postgres, which I encourage people to do by default, uh, there are already a lot of things there. You have already uh, NoSQL-like fields. Uh, able to store JSON and query that, for example. You can store GIS data. You can do full text search uh, directly in Postgres. So uh, if you can use it to the max, you can avoid adding other dependencies to your project. And uh, I think it's great when you, when you can. Um, about the infrastructure, I also I think I understand the benefits of the cloud computing. But for the personal development standpoint, if you're thinking in the very long term, I think in a way it's more more interesting to invest time in getting better at Unix, Unix basics. And uh, 
that's, that's some knowledge that can transfer easily from one vendor to another. And um, yeah, I think it's sometimes more useful uh, personally to spend 1,000 hours getting good at Unix than getting good at a specific AWS product. Um, I understand why the companies prefer to have an army of AWS experts, but I don't think it's always good for, for me and for my projects. Um, some things I put mostly as a reminder for myself, if you're working uh, too much alone and if you're an introvert, it can be dangerously comfortable to become isolated. Um, it's, it's important to remember we are social animals, we need interactions, so do something about it. Speak at conference, even if it makes you uncomfortable, especially if it makes you comfortable, uh, or, or find, find other things that work for you. And what, what I do personally, uh, since as I said, the, the developments I do are not we don't really have competitors, and we are not afraid of competitors because we are working in a more collaborative way. I take that to the, my advantage, and sometimes I call people I know from other work, other, other places, and say, hey, can I just come here to your place today? I work from there, I pay the sandwich for lunch, and we talk, and we exchange a bit on what we work, and since there's not much secret involved, it's generally accepted, and it's super, nice, and I, I call that being a work squatter. Um, I have to, yeah, it feels a bit weird, but in, in my case, it works super well, and people are really enthusiastic about that, and uh, it's good for my mental health, it's good for fostering new ideas, and, and it's good for the business, because you, you have exchange and that gives new project and those kind of things. Um, <clears throat> another tip, uh, another way to take advantage of the fact that uh, Sometimes you work in a non-competitive environment is that people are not, um, are not afraid of uh, having their code stolen by competitors. So you can put everything online from day one very often. And uh, that, can be, that can be quite good. I have this tendency to put everything on GitHub from day one in a project when I can. Um, it has a few benefits. Uh, I can host there the documentation. I can log in, in issues, not only the results, but the, the rationale uh, behind some design decisions, which is very helpful um, three years later when you come back to the project. We can use GitHub Actions as a CI uh, environment, those kind of things. Um, so in a way, it, it, it helps if there are no real um, development infrastructure in the company you're working for. You can do that in public and use free tools like GitHub. And another benefit of putting everything in the public is that um, basically it forced me to do things a bit better because, yeah, my code is readable from day one, so that pushed me a bit more to write better documentation and better tests and, and better code. And I, I use that um, thing to my advantage to, to force me to do things a bit, uh, a bit better. Another tip is to write boring explicit code. I talk about that um, generally. I don't really have time or have a big enough brain for magic. So I like explicit stuff. And uh, for that reason, for example, I don't use much the Django REST framework or the class-based view because I prefer something a bit more obvious uh, and to have the code in front of my eyes where I see everything, what's, what's happening. Um, maybe it's just me, but I think when you're switching between a lot of tools and a lot of projects all the time, it's, it's super helpful to, to work like that. Um, what to test when there is not enough time to test and you still think tests are important? I think I will skip that because I'm running out of time, and especially we had a fantastic talk yesterday uh, about mostly this topic, uh, how to spend less time writing tests and still do good stuff, so I, I prefer to send you to this, um, this wonderful talk and to uh, spend two months time there. And finally, some things that I think could be possibly improved uh, in the future. Uh, as I said, I use a lot of GeoJungo. It's wonderful, but you can feel that it's a bit a niche tool and it receives less development effort than other parts of the framework. Uh, and also, it's not easy because some um, for some uh, geographic operations, it becomes really complex, and so using the ORM is not always the best way, and you are tempted to write raw SQL more, more than for other kind of developments. Um, 
yeah, I use the admin side a lot, and having it more configurable is always is always good. There are things frequently for that, but uh, could have more. And yeah, last one. Sometimes I'd like to have an easier way to share a complete Django project and allow less technical people to deploy it, to configure it, uh, like having dynamic settings, con a configuration wizard to set those settings, a deep, an easy deployment thing. That's some things you can, you can build yourself with a combination of Docker and package to store settings in the database and things like that. But um, yeah, I would like to have something uh, easier and more integrated to do that. But that, there's not a lot. I'm really, really happy with Django, actually. Um, thank you.